Shortly after 11 a.m. on Monday, May 17th, 2021, we're on Oak Street in Champlain, New York, just a, about a mile or so from the U.S.-Canadian border. And we're starting our program with a look at this sign because it says, Site of the Birthplace of Yehudi Ashman, April 21st, 1794. First colonization agent at Liberia, Africa, 1822 to 1828. This sign was erected in 1838. There are postage stamps in Liberia, Liberia showing the, the image of Yehudi Ashman, often called the George Washington of Liberia, a, a nation that was founded for freed slaves who were being sent back and repatriated in the continent of Africa. And Yehudi Ashman, born right here in Champlain back in 1794. We wanted to start with Yehudi Ashman because of today's program put on by the Clinton County Historical Association is going to be all about William Beaumont, Dr. William Beaumont. Beaumont family, very prominent in the history, early history of the settlement of Champlain. And this plaque says, in the first school which stood near this site, we're still on Oak Street, we're probably half a mile from where we started. Close, we're now closer to the village, just maybe a thousand feet or so from the Samuel D. Champlain Museum, which is on the corner of Oak and Elm. In this first school which stood near this site, Dr. William Beaumont, surgeon and physiologist, was schoolmaster from 1807 to 1810. And we point this out because two very prominent people, in all probability, were in the same school at the same time in that 1807, somewhere in that 1807 to 1810 period. Yehudi Ashman as a student and Dr. William Beaumont as the schoolmaster. So now we're on to Plattsburgh and this evening's Clinton County Historical Association presentation. It's been a long time since we've done a program with the Clinton County Historical Association. About a year and a half, maybe. Yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. It was a long time. Yeah, but we're we're starting now, and we have a, a full program for the rest of 2021. And, and who are you, young lady? I am Helen Nurse. I'm the director. Yeah, at the Clinton County Historical Association. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we're not at your campus right now. We're at another location, but this is also going by Zoom, right? Yes, today. yes. We're sending it out. We might have about. 30, 35 people by Zoom and people are coming in here. So this is the first time we've tried this <laughs> because we really wanted to start going live because some people prefer to go to be live now because they're they're all protected with vaccines mm -hmm. and they're yeah. ready to go yeah, you know people are anxious to get out that's right we don't want to need elbows. to nuzzle but we, you know we want to be together so <laughs> right. so we're really excited that this, that we can do this yeah and this facility is well is big enough mm -hmm. to manage for everybody to feel safe so yeah, yeah. we're at 14 dormitory drive here on the yep. former air base yeah just yep. off idaho Yep. So it's an easy place to find if you know where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> One of our board members bought us some food, so we have some Ooh, food. food. But, Food's but, always good. But the, the location was donated to CCHA, and we really, really appreciate it. Well, so, yeah. It is nice, yeah. Yeah. And we very often get locations donated. You know, We've gone to Lake Forest, and, and they're very, mm -hmm. very good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So we really appreciate it. Now, I got the, the official CCHA card today in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a, there it's the last six, little late, a little late. But. <laughs> six events, including yeah. this one. Right. Uh, the next one you've got coming up, uh, is the first three I was very interested in. The others are Saturday, Sunday things that I may not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to have Roger Black's going to speak uh, about the dedication of the Stone Arch Bridge. Mm -hmm. And that's the in June. Uh, on the, a Thursday, the 17th, I think. I or, think so. I think it's yeah, a week, so. a month from today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Today's the 17th. So that's oh, and Marie Teresa. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yes, that's coming up. We're doing again this year, we're doing Sunday on the Island, mm -hmm. you know, where um, Valcor, people, Island. Valcor Island, people can go over. Roger Harwood's doing a tour 
for us this Eight. year of the of the Harney Farm. I think uh, Roger's coming in right now. Oh well, that, there you we go. Speak. Yes, yeah, yeah. And he certainly and, knows his way around. Uh, oh, it's Alcor. wonderful! It's wonderful, isn't that the history of Alcor? And um, and we have a couple of other things. We have um, one of our volunteers is a metal detector, and he's going to tell us the metal detecting tale of things that he found, you know, uh -huh. in our county, and that's one program coming up in yeah. August. Yeah, I and then okay. I think in September we're going to have the um, history of uh, the geography, the geography of, of Clinton County done by a geologist. And uh, so, you know, we're just uh, doing different. Oh, and, and the other thing in July, because I was talking about June, in July, uh, Corky Reinhardt's going to talk about Isaac uh, Johnson and do a presentation on Isaac Johnson, the stonemaker, the, the stone stonemason that did the Cherubusco Church. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I love that church. Yeah, yeah I know. Isn't reception. it beautiful? A beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It is a beautiful yeah. church. So, uh, got lots of exciting things. Plus, what? we're doing tours of the Oval. And well, your name was on one of those, too, as a co-presenter. Which one was that? Well, um, actually, Dick Soper and I, Dick Soper's from the, tra the former Transportation Museum, and he's a authority on um, the Lozier. And we're going to put up a display in the County building together on the oh, okay. Lozier and uh, actually Plattsburgh Traction Company and use lots of pictures. People, it's kind of nice. It's a good pre place to present pictures there. Yeah. Now, uh, people saying, what is the Lozier? The Lozier. Oh, well, we all don't. We don't know the Lozier. Well, yeah, it's a new, yeah, it's don't. a car. Uh, cars that were manufactured. Actually, the engines were manufactured in Plattsburgh, and it's yeah, a right, very right, very a GP old building. And yeah, that's yeah. Funny, a funny building with the out. <laughs> with yeah. the strange walls there yeah. that was part that's of the factory. And that's right. Yeah. That's right. So we're going to do that. A, a photo a photo display at the county. That's why my name was on there. I'm also doing, and I don't know if my name was on for that, we're, we're doing tours at the Oval again okay, yeah, this year. Yeah. Tours, so, yeah. you know. It's on a Saturday or a Sunday. Yeah, or that's the Saturday. Yeah. I, you know. So, yeah, the Sunday is the Sunday on the island. And, of course, the Lighthouse, we hope, is opening up the first um, the first Sunday in uh, July, uh, which happens to be July 4th, I think. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. <laughs> we have a wonderful group of volunteers that support that. Now, it's got to have been a tough year for, for you folks at the CCHA. Well, you know what? We, got, we have such a huge collection to document. So you put yourself that, to work. That's what we that did. We were so busy, and I tell you, we have all our volunteers came back. I saw one Dave Patrick today, in fact, in Champlain. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's wonderful. And, but all our volunteers came back. As soon as we let them back in last, the end of June last year, then we mm -hmm. were in a, a sort of a group, a group, um, hey, there's Roger. <laughs> uh, we were in a group um, two or something, our, our uh, whatever that was and uh, so we could start to have people back in and we had you know we clean all the surfaces and we made sure that all the protocols were met and okay, yeah. people signed in yeah, yeah that's one of the things that I'm trying to remember was on that card I got today you do have a display in the museum starting in June right well we're hoping we're hoping well the June the display we're talking about is at the county building that's oh, going to okay. be at the that's, county building okay, yeah yep. we were okay. hoping to open by Father's Day but we'll see because we're redoing every exhibit just about uh -huh. so that's pretty challenging you know to do that so making new history well yeah <laughs> old using the old history to yeah Anyway, yeah, we're very, very busy. We've always been busy, um, all, all the time. So it was amazing. Uh, we got a lot of our collection, more of our collection documented. So it's, I think we might have even last year, I think the number is a huge number. And it's something like 400 pieces were documented and, and approved by the board to go into our collection, you know, just, I mean, that's <laughs> huge. You know? Yeah. So. And people donate things to us all the time. We got some more Redford glass from wonderful people. Oh. We got some more, two more paintings by Daniel um, Bigelow, you know, just mailed to us. We just, you know, we're getting... But that you all better the time. find room for all this stuff. Well, I know. And I imagine every once in a while you get something that you say, that's nice, but it, yeah, well, well we tough, have had things. So, yeah, there's things that, that we don't know. There's too big for us, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And you mentioned that the uh, Transportation Museum had closed. I didn't realize that till maybe a couple of weeks ago when I saw Babby Farm and Learning Museum yeah. mentioning that 
The transportation museum has closed. That's, yeah. that's really too bad. Yeah. That's, uh, I know. Been, uh, COVID had a, a part to do with that. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I'm sure it's more complex than we would appreciate, but it's, uh, yeah, it's very, because it was such a popular museum, you know, and so the transportation story is still there, and we have Dick, Dick Soper, who was, mm -hmm. well, you, if you yeah. ever had a oh, tour yeah. there, yeah, yeah. you know what he did, does. And, and so he's. The museum was started basically because of the lozier. Yeah, yeah. That's and he's yeah. working with us now, so we're very, very fortunate. So to have him on, uh, as a volunteer, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, come on over and visit us. And well, we're not that far away, and we didn't always worked with closely with right. them anyway. Yeah, so it wasn't a new there, relationship, yeah. you know. It's just so now, so it's very exciting. Well, anything else, Ellen? That you know? No, I guess not. <laughs> I'll think of something after we finish. Oh, well, it's usually the way I am. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I should have. Uh, I should have done that. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, we are going to talk to the man of the hour, except he's not really the man of the hour, because the man of the hour is going to be William Beaumont, but yeah. you're, the, you're the man who's going to tell us about it. Your name? My name is Paolo Fedi. All right, and uh, doesn't sound like a Plattsburgh name. Uh, no, yeah, actually, area? I'm coming from a long, far away from here. I'm coming from Italy. Uh -huh. I came in this country many years ago, 25 years ago, actually. I came here to actually study cancer research. I was always interested in the stomach function. Uh -oh. I did quite a lot of study I and mean, you know smoking and the, the effect of smoking on healing of the ulcer in the stomach. And then I had an opportunity to come to the United States at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda and that's how it actually brought me here in the United States. I was very excited here, had a lot of nice work and I felt very comfortable living in the United States so I never left and said so slowly I move up north <laughs> and now I'm finally in Plattsburgh. <laughs> You can't go much further north and stay in the United States, you know. <laughs> You're right. But Canadian, a pretty good friend of ours. Oh, yeah, they're, they're not so bad. <laughs> All my ancestors are from there. So, <laughs> uh, When did you first hear about uh, William Beaumont? You talked about stomachs and so on. So, so interesting. It, it, we always learn, I think, in medical school, that there's some point that is this guy with a hole in the stomach and some people look it into that. But I really never really understood very much the importance of his uh, science until actually I came to Plattsburgh. Um, that forced me really to kind of go and read the original book instead of just reading something on Google uh, or in a ghost tour when people uh, make it fun of him and actually understanding how much importance I think his science is and I think how much underappreciated it is. And Alexis St. Martin, who was his, uh, shall I say, guinea pig? <laughs> yeah. Uh, is the, the Canadian gentleman, the French-Canadian gentleman who uh, had a hole in his stomach and it didn't heal or I'm not sure if it didn't heal or Beaumont wouldn't let it heal or whatever but he kept uh, uh, watching it and uh, right. recording all the stuff. Actually I think it's interesting and I will explain in my talk that the uh, Alexis was he received a close three feet from a, 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 a shotgun uh -huh. that was so close to him, or three right. feet so therefore the, the, he had 12 inches opening that is there. There was no way that this guy could actually was could close, I think, his uh, his opening um, with the technique that we had at the time. I think it would have been even difficult, at, uh, even even now, I think, for him to survive. There was yes, enough skin to do it. There was not enough skin. And so I think what Beaumont did was pretty, uh, at least he kept him alive. And in right. fact, I think he was able to live until he was 87 and had 22 children. So he was pretty good. He outlived Beaumont. <laughs> he definitely outlived Beaumont, <laughs> even with a hole in the stomach. So that was pretty good. Okay. So. Uh, how far back in Beaumont's history will you be going in the presentation? Today? So actually, I'm going to I'm going to start from his birth and, and okay, how. Great. And actually, I think his relationship with all this area. We're going to mention Champlain. I know mm -hmm. that's uh, yeah. the town that you that you know well. And uh, we're going to mention uh, Plattsburgh, and then uh, we're going to go until um, 1833 when the a publication about the research of Beaumont was made and I'm going to give you some clo uh, closing remark I think regarding I think the, what what you know the the end of life of both Alexis and uh, Beaumont okay great so you've done some research then. yeah actually I think the more I read about him and the more discovery things I, I found that is many of the things that now we study about irritable bowel syndrome that Beaumont already told us in 1833 so really history is teach us something you know, and it's amazing that he was tuned in enough to know that this was important to, to 
to you're right. This. You're right. And I think Beaumont was really a self-educated man. I mean, he, he came was. from, uh, it was a farmer from uh, um, uh, Connecticut, and then he moved to Champlain. It's just his interest in reading and his brilliance and also his attention to detail that make him have, kind of like who it is and get the discovery that he did. Yeah, uh, and there's buildings named after him. I know, I know there's one in Texas. There's one here in the Plattsburgh Correct. campus. Correct. And actually, the most uh, interesting is like in Michigan, uh, there is a, an entire health system with eight hospitals and a medical school under his name. Yeah. Okay. That island he was on, Skate Mackinac. Right Mackinac. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Correct. Every once in a while, I hear something happen, the weather or something, and I say, oh. Yeah, we know <laughs> what it is. Moment. Yes, <laughs> you're right. And he was very instrumental here in the Battle of Plattsburgh. Uh, For he, sure. I think that would be another talk that I, I, more and more I read in a like, letter that he actually wrote during that time. And I think at some point I will try to focus on that historical aspect of him and the Battle of Plattsburgh. Okay. Yes. Thank you. We're looking Thank forward. You. Thank you. We're ready to go. Good evening, this is Briggs. We have uh, a lot of people on Zoom and we have a lot of people here today. So thank you very much. I'm Helen Nurska. I'm the director of the Clinton County Historical Association. Um, and this is our official, it's officially opening our program for the 2021 season with uh, Dr. Fady. And it's really our privilege to have him here. Um, and he, to listen to his presentation on the life and legend of one of Clinton County's and the nation's most remarkable citizens, Dr. William Beaumont. Um, we're providing access uh, to this both obviously in person and on Zoom. Um, I want to thank the, the people that have helped us so much uh, with this facility uh, uh, and getting us going here. Uh, many thanks. Uh, to that, for that, those people, and um, to our Zoom guests, um, we believe when the presentation begins, you will hear uh, Dr. Uh, Fady's voice, but you might not see him until the end. We've been trying some, we've been uh, using some practice here, and that's what we've come across. But put any questions that you have, uh, Zoom, my Zoom visitors, in chat, and we will get those and, and read them to him. Um, now, about uh, Dr. Fady, he's uh, just, uh, he's remarkable, <laughs> and you'll see soon, and I'll go, I'll sit down, um, but he's both an MD and a PhD, who's been practicing um, gastroenterology in Plattsburgh since 2006. Dr. Fady completed medical school in 1988 uh, at the University of Florence in Italy, where he graduated magna cum laude with a thesis on the effects of smoking on the healing of uh, gastric ulcers. His interest in gastroenterology um, brought him to the United States to complete a doc, um, PhD in cancer biology at the National Center Institute, uh, National Cancer Institute in Fresno, <coughs> Maryland. He then moved to Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City where he continued working on the biology of cancer cells at the Rutenberg Cancer Center, and he spent seven years there as the head of a lab. In 2000, Dr. Fady decided to return to medical uh, care and completed a residency uh, in internal medicine and a fellowship in gastroenterology with further training specializing in um, Barrett's esophagus and endoscopic, uh, and I'm brutalizing these words, um, ultrasound. Dr. Fady moved to, I'm, I'm finished soon, he moved to Plattsburgh in 2006 and under um, Gastroenterology Associates of Plattsburgh. And then in 2015, he opened his own office, which is, to no, maybe nobody's surprised, called Beaumont Gastroenterology <laughs> Services on Durkee Street. His love for medicine and human interactions brought him to the Plattsburgh area. Um, he felt practicing here was going to be more rewarding than New York City, and I, I think he probably will verify that for us. Uh, he loves the North Country. He's um, a hiker, a kayaker. He also um, is passionate about local history. If you go to his office, he has wonderful maps all over. He loves maps and documents of Plattsburgh, and he collects them all of Clinton County. So um, it's my pleasure to turn tonight over to Dr. Katie. Hello. Hello, can I interrupt for just a minute? Yes. For anyone who isn't familiar with the facility, 
There are restrooms. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Helen, and uh, thank you to the Clinton County Historical Association for inviting me. Um, good evening to all of you present here, and good evening also to the large crowd that I think is on Zoom. Hello to you. Uh, so when I came to Plattsburgh, it actually struck me how much history was around me here. Uh, I'm a passionate about history, and I'm a native of Italy, as you already know, and. There, I really I learned how to live with the history every day. I believe that really history uh, can guide us, I think, uh, to go forward and to move for the future. So I'm still very surprised about uh, when people enter my office and they say, why did you use the name Beaumont for your practice? So what I'm going to do today, I want to introduce you to William Beaumont. Um, although everybody knows the names, but uh, we want to discuss, I think, how important it is uh, in the history of medicine. So, and how he put Plattsburgh, not only um, our city is famous for the war of Plattsburgh, but also in the history of medicine. So we're gonna share uh, the um, content of the presentation with you today. Just bear with us a second. So the name of William Beaumont, uh, it's uh, all over this, uh, the Clinton County area. And one of the most famous buildings is really is the Beaumont Hall Science Building that you see in the Plattsburgh State uh, uh, at SUNY. However, the name Beaumont has been used not only here, but all over the United States. Uh, uh, the Army Medical Center in El Paso, Texas is, the, is named after him. The largest healthcare in the system in Michigan is named after him. It's a eight hospital, a medical school, 5,000 physician, and 145 uh, outpatient practices. So who is William Beaumont? He was born in Lebanon, Connecticut from a, in November 21st, 1785. He's coming from a family of farmers. He did not really like farming too much, and so at the age of 21, he moved to Champlain, New York. There, he joined his brother, Samuel, who moved there a few years before. Uh, the town of Champlain was picked not just randomly, but uh, two uncles, Dan and William, moved there. They were revolutionary uh, war um, veterans, and they moved there a few years before. And in fact, many of them were involved in the foundation of, this, of the city. So he arrived knowing no trade, but reasonably was well educated for the local uh, area, and therefore became teaching as well as his brother did. So if you go on Oak Street, you can see this sign here with the first school where actually he worked. Um, in letters that he sent to his uh, sister, Lucretia, and also his family, he reported that he was very happy with the work that he was doing. And uh, apparently he also had a, a, a job in the stores, so his life was really settling well in, in Champlain. However, Beaumont was an avid um, reader, he was very interested in science, and slowly he became more interested in medicine. He started borrowing book f uh, from uh, Dr. John Pomeroy from Burlington, Vermont. Dr. Pomeroy is actually founded the College of Medicine in Burlington. In 1810, Beaumont uh, uh, moved across the lake and settled in uh, St. Albans, Vermont. There, he joined the practice, the, the practice of Dr. Chandler. And he, do, and he did there an apprenticeship uh, to go towards medical school. Um, he stayed in his household for two years. Um, his education there was basically attending bedside um, patient uh, home visit and also dissection of body parts that became available and also an intense reading. So Beaumont was able to obtain his medical license uh, in 1812 from the Third Medical Society of Vermont. So as he graduated in 1812 and obtained his medical license, um, there was a lot of talk about war. Uh, the war was imminent, there was uh, war talk everywhere, and uh, therefore for a newly um, 
licensed doctor, the military surgery offered some more of an excitement and an experience. Um, there was a high demand at that time, both for recruits to join the military, but also to um, staff the hospital that in the meantime was opening, uh, that was crossing both Burlington and Plattsburgh under the United States Army. So his medical exposure at that time was really limited to um, the apprenticeship that he did in St. Albans. So therefore, five days after he obtained his medical license, he joined the 6th Regiment Infantry under the General Dearborn Army of the North, which was stationed in Fort Saranac. He later went to, um, towards Lake Erie, and uh, he, he participated in the um, 1812 war. He saw action in York, Toronto, and Fort um, St. George on Niagara on the lake, and he was mentioned many times for bravery. This will be another talk for another time about his uh, involvement with the war. Um, then, uh, after the war ended, uh, and we were in um, 1815, Dr. Beaumont was actually stationed, returned to Plattsburgh, and was stationed in, in Fort Moreau. Uh, the end of the war is coming. The city was waiting for the Treaty of Ghent to be signed that will uh, end it, finally this war. Um, he became restless at this point, and there is some letter that he sent to his brother in uh, 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 Lebanon, um, Connecticut. He was mentioning that he was afraid of the peace, actually. His, all his life was actually built, uh, and his career was built uh, during war. He knew how to amputate a body part, he knew how to do these things, and then what happened now that there is no more war, what am I going to do? And so he left the army also because at that time there was a, a problem with the government sending money to pay uh, um, for people. Of course, the money were coming from Washington, D.C., and so they are coming up to Plattsburgh probably will take a time. And he made him nervous, I think, that there was delay in his pay, so he left the uh, United States Army, and uh, in 1815, he opened a practice on his own. Actually, this is interesting. I found this document. You can see that it's a notice, Dr. Beaumont and Center, that inform the population, I think, that he's opening a pra medical practice in there. You notice also that I think they're selling dye woods and grocery and store. This is no Hannaford's or, or Walmart, but at that time, it, it, there was no store, no medical practice, I think, that, that is built as we do right now. Very little medicine are available. Most of them are concoction of food that, they, that can be also considered vegetable or um, not real true medicine. And therefore, many of the medical um, um, practices really do, did have a grocery store. Um, built in. So he opened the practice in 1815 and he was very busy from the beginning. Uh, he was very well known, apparently he was a good, phys good physician and therefore he joined, uh, he, he was successful at that time. If you actually um, travel downtown Plattsburgh and you go at the corner between Margaret and Bridge Street, you actually find this on the wall where actually now there is the Ashley Furniture. So that's the building where the practice was. Uh, in 1929, the uh, physician hospital at that time and the medical staff at that time placed this uh, plaque there in his memory um, as an American pioneer physiologist. Beaumont practiced between 1815 and 1819. And uh, at that time, however, in 1819, Dr. Joseph Lovell, uh, who was a friend of uh, uh, Beaumont, uh, basically was his boss when uh, the Battle of 1812 um, the War of 1812 was here in Plattsburgh. Uh, Lovell was uh, the chief of the hospital, of the military army hospital between Burlington and Plattsburgh. He became the Surgeon General of the United States Army. So he was uh, the um, very powerful figure, and he was still friend with uh, Dr. Beaumont. At that time, as the war was ending, the border with, with Canada was quite wide, and therefore they needed to keep the Northwest Territory under check. So um, the Surgeon General were looking for a physician to be placed them in different fort along the border with Canada, so in this way they could maintain the, um, the, the, the border at, uh, at that time. So therefore Beaumont was finally convinced to rejoin the army again, and then he was ordered to report to Fort Mackinac in Northern Michigan Territory in 1820. So we always struggle, I think, uh, where is Fort Mackinac? Fort Mackinac is in an island uh, at the confluence between uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. 
this island has a strategic place uh, um, because it uh, played an important role even in the um, previous war of the American Revolution. And, and it was an important post uh, for the Northwest uh, Territory. And the island was not just a military post. It had a mixed population civilian as well as military. And the most important thing uh, that, that it is is that there was the regional headquarter for the American Fur Company. This was the company of the John Jacob Astor. So every time that you see one of those hats that they are this way long, that is Beaver. And so this is mostly where Beaver, they were came in from Canada, and this was the post where the American Fur Company, they could exchange and purchase the fur that then we have brought it down to New York and they're making hat uh, in the United States. So is this is the island where uh, completely changed the life of, of uh, Dr. Beaumont. I want to do a little um, digression here just to add another person uh, involved here, Deborah Greenplatt. Um, so Dr. Beaumont um, left his heart here in Plattsburgh apparently. Um, he returned, he left the Plattsburgh in 1820 and returned in the summer of 1821 to marry Deborah Green Platt and brought with her back in Fort Mackinac. Um, so Deborah Platt is basically the daughter of Israel Green. Um, during the Battle of Plattsburgh, there is all this festivity about the tavern and Green the tavern, and that's uh, who it is. Um, and Deborah was uh, in, always attending the uh, wounded during the 1812, and she, and she therefore uh, was working and be in the tavern at that time. Um, Dr. Beaumont was a frequent um, guest of the tavern there, not because he's had much uh, alcoholic problem or he was drinking excessively, but because uh, the tavern was the site of the medical association at that time, the local medical um, society. And so therefore, he figured he was there, he, and he met Deborah there. Deborah was previously engaged to Nathaniel, Nathan, Nathaniel, I'm sorry, Platt. So Platt was actually the nephew of Zephaniah, who was the founder of Platt uh, in uh, 1785. Nathaniel Platt died in 1816, so therefore the engagement, uh, Deborah was a widow, and uh, uh, became then uh, the new wife, or uh, Dr. Beaumont. So, how did she involve in all this story? So, here the date is important, it's June 6, 1822. This is the date that will change the entire life of uh, these two men. William Beaumont, who I already introduced it to you, and the next one is Alexis Saint Martin. This was a Canadian, he uh, is coming from uh, Berthier, outside uh, Montreal, and uh, he was working for the American Fur uh, Company and uh, he was on the Mackinac Island on June 6, uh, trying to trade his find his uh, fur. Um, at that time, uh, Beaumont was in his home. He has a, um, um, his wife was nine months pregnant. Two days later, she will deliver Sarah, the first daughter, and uh, Beaumont received a page from the hospital. No, I'm, I'm sorry, it was just a, a, a joke. Uh, he, uh, somebody came knocking to his door, and he was found that and he was told that there was a person that was very sick and was ill at the trading post. Beaumont uh, went to the trading post and saw a man on the floor. He realized immediately that this man really had not much chance to survive. He had a shotgun wound at three feet of distance, which basically perforated his abdomen and went through from the, from the back. Uh, when Beaumont inspected, he could actually see the rib cage that was sticking out because the the uh, shotgun had broke some of the rib, and so the pieces were sticking out of, the, of his abdomen. The diaphragm was broken. He could see the, the lungs coming out, and the material from his intestine and the stomach were all pouring out. Beaumont didn't think that actually the patient would survive, so he attended uh, some care, minimal at the beginning. He left them there overnight. He went back home. Um, the next day, he, came, he went back before he went to the hospital to see what happened to this man, expecting that he would be dead, but he was still alive, he was febrile, he was shaking. Beaumont took him and brought it to the hospital and took care of him over the next few days. He realized that the patient was resilient and it was actually was maybe possible, had a chance to survive these things in there. He continued to uh, remove pieces of the um, ribs that were left in there, cauterize some of the tissue that were present in there, and try to attend the wound at that time. Um, of course, uh, the, um, 
uh, Alexis was fired by the American Fur Company because he was not really working anymore, and the military, did, he was not a military man, and therefore they did not want to keep him in the hospital anymore because they didn't want to pay for him. So at that time, uh, there was some welfare uh, um, committee that was existing in the, uh, in the town of, um, of, on the, in the island of Mackinac. So they agreed to offer the, um, Um, sorry, that we'll, we'll ask the signal there. And we, they offered to pay him uh, for uh, several weeks. And uh, however, as they realized that his, his problem will live a little longer and they will need all the money, they decided they would want to get rid of Alexis and send it back to Canada. Beaumont realized that there was no way that this man by himself would be put on a canoe and send it back uh, to Canada from uh, that way, and therefore brought him home. Uh, with his new daughter and, uh, and his wife, and attended to his care uh, for the next two years. So he took care of the wound. Of course, his wife participated in, the, um, in, in, in that um, duty also. Um, he uh, gave him providing food and clothing. So this is the original uh, drawing uh, from uh, Beaumont regarding the wound at different stage and different time. And uh, basically, they realized that the wound was uh, healing and was improving, but there was no way that actually they could close. They could make a closure. There is always a criticism, I think, regarding this uh, that uh, um, Beaumont kept the hole open because he wanted to do experiment. And this is not true at all. Uh, first of all, I don't think that even today anybody will be able to close, to make the closure unless you have a transplant of skin or tissue from another organ. So this is not technology that was uh, existing at the beginning of 1800. And the other question is kind of like he had significant perforation of his, of his stomach and although he tried to um, um, repair, that it's a 12 inches was the shotgun damage in there. So 12 inches is a large hole in there. I think it's lucky that the patient survived. So slowly, however, the area um, healed around it and completely created a stoma through which Beaumont was, ab was able to see the stomach itself. Of course, the content of acid that is pouring out will even not allow the area to heal, and as we know now, for example. Um, so this is the spring of 1824. Two years later, this is what a, a reconstruction of what we believe was uh, uh, after the um, after the healing um, of the left side flank of Alexis Saint Martin. So I'll read you a wording from him. Spring 1824. Alexis has recovered his natural health and strength. The aperture remained, and the surrounding wound was firmly cicatrized to its edges. So think about it that Beaumont has observed this man at least twice a day and the wound twice a day for two years. He has been in his house for two years. He realized, I think, the opportunity that he has is that he was able to see inside the stomach something that not, it was never done before. There was a lot of scientists, especially in Italy and Germany, that had done a lot of study on animals. And, or in cadaver, but nobody have able to see exactly how a stomach work when you can actually put some food inside and how he can heal. During that time, both, uh, Alexis was able to eat through his mouth and therefore the food was actually coming out. And so slowly Beaumont created some kind of pressure and, got, uh, and tissue uh, and, and cotton pad that he was able to put it so in this way the food will not come out from the stomach and sit into the stomach. Slowly, however, the stomach created some more of a pseudo valve that we, uh, as the tissue overgrow, and therefore only in certain position, then the opening was remained open. So therefore, is this opportunity and this uh, um, occasion, I think, that these two men encountered, that Beaumont realized that he, in front of him, he, were, he could actually understand and study the digestion of the um, of the, body, of the food in general in human. So in 1825, he started doing research and put him in, in writing on, uh, uh, on Alexis Saint-Martin. He started in 1825 in Fort Mackinac, 
in Fort Niagara and later in Plattsburgh. In 1825, at the end of the year, uh, Alexis returned to Montreal um, and basically stayed there for four years. <clears throat> Beaumont was very anxious because he realized the amount of information that he was able to obtain. And he had a first publication in the, um, the Philadelphia Medical Recorder in, uh, uh, in 1825 about the initial experiment uh, on uh, um, um, Alexis and Martin. Alexis went to uh, Quebec and Mary. Uh, he had two children. And then uh, in 1829, he re-enrolled um, uh, uh, with the American Fur Company, and he was able to contact again Beaumont. So the two of them meet again, this time in Ford Crawford. It's called Prairie du Chien, which is basically at the confluence between the Wisconsin River and the Mississippi. I think it's where now Wisconsin is. And there they continue to do experiment uh, on uh, uh, Alexis. Um, the wife was with him, and the children were with him. Um, this, the family was paid, it was given a salary initially from uh, Beaumont, and later it actually was given from the United States Army. So it, it's interesting how I actually got some money when I came here in this country from the United States Army for uh, cancer research, but I think this is one of the first grants that the United States Army actually had been given to um, medicine um, to do science. And all because uh, Dr. Joseph Lowell was a friend of Beaumont, and so he understood, I think, the importance of what he had um, um, at that time. Um, in 1831, um, uh, Alexis' wife was very unhappy uh, living in Fort Crawford there. And at that time, also, there was a, a, a big outbreak of cholera. She was very worried about the children. Uh, she was fed up of, of uh, being here, so she convinced Alexis to go back, and they all took a, a canoe and went back to uh, Montreal. Uh, Beaumont was devastated, it's true. He put him in a love letter. He offered him money, uh, um, but um, this is not, not occur. Um, Alexis returned in 1831, and more studies were done in Washington, D.C., and New York. At that time, uh, the United States General Army uh, general um, have advised uh, Beaumont to contact the uh, other uh, medical center in Washington and New York City to also uh, help him, I think, in doing research and possible publication. But finally, Beaumont asked him to come back uh, in um, Plattsburgh, 1833, um, because he realized that he was supposed to have his publication um, uh, done soon and was at his own cost. So as you can imagine, that he realized that he was going in Plattsburgh would have been cheaper, and that's exactly what he did. He returned in Plattsburgh in 1833 to publish his uh, um, um, experiments and observation, and then Alexis returned to Canada and never really came back to the United States. So Beaumont did the three type of experiment. Um, the first one um, it was related to collection of gastric juice. At that time, he was able to have a, a rubber tube and he was able to collect it using a, a funnel, like do putting the tube inside it through the aperture, and then collecting tube. So he could study um, what the gastric juice was really was. The one that is actually more exciting than everybody uh, remember is the placement of food on a string via the stoma to observe digestion. This is, was clever um, because he was able to uh, mm, decide the exact piece of meat that he could actually study, or vegetable or anything else, put it on a string, drop it into the fistula, and then uh, observe it by pulling it back and see uh, how much was digested um, after several hours. So we could actually uh, understand uh, how we digest food. And the last um, uh, set of observation are based on the stomach lining. Um, if uh, Alexis was placing himself on the left side by doing these things, so he could actually open more uh, the, um, the stoma that actually he had at that time, and therefore looking inside, he could actually observe the status of the mucosa, of the lining of the stomach, and then uh, uh, make observation. So he collected approximately 200 experiments that were done over the course of eight years and published this book that is called Experiments and Observation of the Gastric Juice and the Physiology of Digestion. The incredible thing is that this incredible amount of information was published in Plattsburgh in 1833. A thousand books were published, 
And, um, I do have a copy of, of this book, and it's interesting to find it because it's a, uh, as everybody say, it's very poor quality. The paper is newspaper paper, and uh, um, the print is poor. This was done by the local um, printer of the newspaper, and, and therefore, the, why the reason was cheap. It was not bound, bound book, a leather, and you would have expected a book uh, with a significant importance in medicine at that time. Um, the, um, the book was uh, um, distributed. Um, um, Dr. Beaumont sent this uh, to the local physician, gave it also to many other physicians. The copy actually that I have is come from the uh, director of the Albany Medical Center. There was his copy uh, that was there. And I don't believe the guy never really read it because it's perfectly bound, it was never <laughs> open. <laughs> so, um, um, so Beaumont didn't make any money out of this book in there. Uh, but the interest in it was incredible because people realized for the first time that they actually could understand how the digestion was working and this was study done in human. Uh, the physiology book of the time immediately put the, the information of Beaumont inside and so the demand for this book was huge. So 2,000 copies were then uh, reprinted in uh, Boston and then later in 1847 a second edition by, revised by Dr. Samuel Beaumont uh, the um, um, the um, cousin of Dr. Beaumont, of William Beaumont, um, was uh, uh, published in Burlington, and another 3,000 copies were, were made. The uh, book uh, is, uh, this is just a not a real book, but it's kind of like, a, this is the size, it's an octavo of 280 page, pages, and, uh, um, and uh, um, it was uh, also published in German and also was published in Scotland. Uh, Germany, of course, had a lot of uh, research that was going on, especially in dogs, and so that was an incredible information that they needed to know in their own native language. Thank you. Carol is bringing me some water to the rescue. <coughs> um, so um, I'm just I'm going to highlight here a few of the um, passages just to see the uh, attention to detail that these men have. This is a, tr a true scientist. And uh, the other question, like he was not really a, a trained in a more academic university, um, although with the limitation of the medicine, but he was really a, a, a loner, the guy that really self educated, uh, mostly here in St. Alban and in Plattsburgh. And you can look at, for example, experiment 51. He described the time. He described the, the amount of minutes that is in there. Uh, he looked at the stomach. He, dis, he um, described the, um, the amount of, of juice that is inside. Also, he made a lot of annotation regarding like, a, the health of the patient. As you can see here, there was trace of tobacco. Uh, so there was a, something in there. And so that gave us the opportunity by logging in all this information and this recording to actually analyze and see the role of all these different agents, I think, on how we function. Also, he had a very detailed description Description on the right side, you can see, of the temperature of the stomach that he measured, and also, in particularly, matching with the temperature of the environment and the weather that was actually occurring at the same time. So this is actually, it's, an, it's a huge amount of information that uh, at the beginning it seems to kind of like a little blind and not making much sense, but actually what it make it great because the raw data was able to collect the information and the conclusion that he had. So let's go to what really Beaumont uh, uh, discussed and what was really his finding and why he's considered so important. So I'm just going to summarize in four slides, uh, <coughs> try to get the concept and also trying to actually correlate it to our daily life. So um, at the time in which Beaumont uh, um, lived, we always thought that the stomach was digesting food uh, by maceration and uh, fermentation. So we put food into the stomach, the food sitting into the stomach in there, there is the movement, it crunch it, we can hear it, and then slowly it get digested. So this was kind of like a it's not really what will really happen, but we have no idea because uh, if you think about it, you would have to have a, a study on a cadaver that just eat it and then uh, um, uh, look at them if they die with the food on the stomach or if there was animal involved that you can actually um, 
euthanize them and then look at inside the stomach. Of course, by that time, the stomach will die, the tissue will, not, will be degraded, so it will not be alive, and also will be just one point in time when, when you actually euthanize the, the, um, the animal. So he was able to actually um, prove uh, several things in there. One, he gave the first description of what gastric juice is. He was able to show that there is uh, no acid in the stomach if there is no food. So therefore, he was able to realize that by putting food into the stomach, the stomachs now start producing acid. I'm sorry, start producing gastric juice. The gastric juice is secreted by the stomach, normally is not present in there, and that gastric juice is really what it calls digestive. There is a physician in Italy, that, his name was uh, uh, Spallanzani. He uh, did a lot of study in animal, and he actually theorized that the digestion was really occurring because of the gastric juice and it was be a chemical reaction, it was not just the composition of food that was in the stomach. But he could never really demonstrate it. Beaumont really proved and demonstrated his theory that digestion occurred by a chemical um, process. And so the component of the gastric juice that make it digestive is really what is called muriatic acid, or what we call it now more commonly is hydrochloric acid. And that is what causes the digestion. <coughs> the brilliant experiment is that to take now a, in, a, a, in, in a piece of glass, you put the piece of food, you take the juice from the rubber band, from the rubber tube out of the uh, Beaumont, put it in, a, in, in the glass jar, and now you can see that the digestion can occur not only inside the stomach, but also outside. Although he realized it may take a little bit of time. Longer time because it also you require temperature. The uh, body has a temperature inside that is higher than room temperature, and so therefore you actually you will have more, um, you can speed up the process. And another thing, so we wrote it down here, that mucus and gastric juice are separate entity. Frequently there is a mucus that is covered in there, but that's not what is important for digestion. This is more a lining of protected things, a protective layer that actually is on top of the stomach, which it, it help uh, to protect from other injury or things that we ingested. And digestion can occur outside the stomach, and the stomach movement has the function to speed the digestion. So they realize that the movement is similar to what taking a, a piece of glass with the food in there and just shake it. So in this way, you allow the more contact of the uh, acid with the food, and so in this way, you can speed up the digestion. So this, although seems pretty easy to us, this was the first time there was actually proof, confirmed that there exists hydrochloric acid, and uh, um, and actually it's, it's the cause of, dig, uh, of digest, it's how we digest food. Another major observation, and I think this is the one that for me it's incredible and it's not really much appreciated, is that the mental disturbances have a profound influence on the secretion of gastric juice and digest. So when we say mental disturbances, it, it's not means, uh, it, it means anxiety, it means stress. When, Boma, when Alexis was waking up in the morning and he was upset, he was high rated, um, he overdid it the night before, or he didn't sleep, or he was wild, and uh, perhaps he was not feeling too good, and means that the body was under stress, he realized that inside the stomach did not look good. It was inflamed, it was red, there was some white punctated uh, material that was showing, more mucus was producing, and he was not digesting food very well. So this is actually the first time that now we can realize that there is a connection between mind and digestion. And not only, he was able to prove also that there is, the weather can, af can affect the digestion. Of course, the weather can affect us. As we know, we spend uh, many uh, months uh, inside, we don't see the sun. Now all of a sudden, the sun appears, we feel much better, we feel happy. And so this it's really was bringing up a lot of new concepts that were really not known before, because nobody had the chance to do a study in human. Um, the other thing that is a major uh, uh, understanding of that is uh, um, digestion is disturbed by emotion, so we already said it, coffee, tea, and alcohol. And this is a big drama, I think, of human in general. We love coffee, and the more the better, um, and tea and alcohol. And then what, what actually is the first one to, and people knew that alcohol was bad because you get inebriated, but it was never really making this connection that actually was causing damage to the stomach, and it can affect how you digest it. So if you overdrink it, you know that you're not going to be able to actually digest the food very well. The other thing is that movement of the stomach is part of the digestion and change under different circumstances. So 
as uh, many things change, as, um, as the, the mental disturbances, the stress can affect the secretion of, of juices, can also affect the movement of the stomach. And this we know, for example, when you're actually going to get ill, when you get ill or you get a viral infection, uh, you feel like nausea. Nausea is gastroparesis. It's basically the stomach will not move. And that's normal on all of us when we're sick. We don't want to eat. Food bothers us and we, we get sick in there. So actually, this is all back dated to 1833. This is another major thing that actually um, uh, this set of observation on uh, how we actually digest food. And then different food is digested differently. Um, there is four pages, I think, of food, the meticulous detail about how long it takes us to actually um, uh, digest food. Uh, this actually opened now the field of uh, um, dietary sciences, sciences and nutritional sciences uh, because at that time we didn't really know. You could say that uh, uh, gluten can bother you or alcohol can bother you, but you really didn't know how long it takes you to digest it. Um, and so it opened uh, the um, field to new sciences about nutrition. So I'm just going to over with you a few examples because actually it's kind of fun that because it, it's really related to, to us every day. So vegetables are digested more slowly than meat. So this is actually it's an interesting concept in there because uh, we always say eat your vegetable for what reason? To slow you down a little bit and to fill you up. To fill you up because it actually will make the stomach distended so now you have, you're less hungry and so we hope that in this way we eat less of other food in there. And another thing that is important is cooked food is more digestible than raw food. Uh, there is many theory about these things, even uh, of the extinction of the uh, many animals in the past, uh, including the dinosaur, that uh, if you have to eat only vegetable and raw food in there, you will require much larger volume uh, to actually extract calorie. So if you can cook the food, it's actually will be, uh, it's, more, it's partially digested and therefore you can absorb and you can extract much more energy from food. There is another uh, um, interesting discussion that he bring it up about oily substances, so fried food basically. Uh, so he just reported that if you eat a venison steak that actually is cooked with pork fat, it will take you much longer to digest it if you own, if you didn't put pork fat in there. So if you if you just have a venison uh, steak with no fat in there, the added fat, I'm sorry, um, that basically it will take you uh, less time to actually digest it. So this is exactly the concept that we all experience, that I think a fried food will make you more bloated, will make you more distended, because it will take you longer time to digest it compared to uh, a more lean uh, a meat that actually you can ingest. It. And many times the vegetable can actually can pass undigested through, and many people always complain about these things, even in my practice they always say, Oh, I see corn, I see this, and I see this in there. Well, that's normal, uh, because actually you do not digest corn. We are not built to digest corn. Corn did not exist on the planet, we invented, and therefore we cannot digest it unless you have a different kind of stomach. So therefore, if you don't chew it, it will just go pass through, um, and it stay in your body for much lo longer time. The problem with many of these vegetables, they are not digested, it will go into your large intestine where there they will encounter bacteria. This is not Beaumont, this is something I'm gonna add it to you, but it actually it's uh, um, the foundation for irritable bowel syndrome is basically the relationship with food that is undigested and the type of bacteria that you have into your colon will create a fermentation. The bacteria need a substance to actually ferment it and therefore will cause you bloating and will cause you distension. And that's what all the experience, you eat something. The question is kind of like that each of us has a different type of bacteria and different type of pattern, and so therefore each of us will have a specific relationship with food. Um, and other things that Beaumont stated is that the solid food is sooner dispensed uh, out of the stomach compared to liquid. So it's not really a good idea to drink a lot of liquid when you eat solid. And, and this is go against any theory that you know that you need to drink gallons and gallons of water uh, which there's not much basic science for that. So if you're bloated and distended, do not drink. Eat, 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 uh, drink a minimal amount of, of liquid, so in this way you will digest it much faster. The other thing is that he realized that some condiment, vinegar and salt in, in small amount, is actually can uh, 
uh, help you in the digestion. Vinegar is acetic acid, and so therefore it can actually help you in uh, uh, um, digesting uh, the food in, in, in there. And uh, salt also can help you in uh, um, the process of uh, um, acidification of the, of the meat and therefore of digestion. Coffee, tea, and alcohol, he was able to see it very well. Uh, apparently, Alexis was love alcohol and love drinking. And so, uh, Beaumont was very upset about it all the time. He was returning from a night of drinking, and in the morning, he wanted to look at the, the stomach, and he was always seeing that the stomach was very inflamed, red, and he was kind of like, a, he was afraid that that would compromise his experiment uh, at that time. Another uh, observation uh, that is very important is quantity. So this is an experiment that we do all the time at Thanksgiving, correct? I mean, we all feel sick after then and we want to sleep and, and we blame the poor turkey because I don't know what substance he has in the turkey. It's not a turkey. It's that because we eat a large amount of food that is, that is huge and is so much com com of fat um, and, and meat with fat and, and sugars that we put them all together. So they are very difficult to digest. The stomach work. Uh, hard to do actually do it and therefore it drain you of energy so blood will be shifted from muscle from your head and things and then it will go down to the stomach because the stomach now need to overproduce acid and therefore oh you want to take a nap after you eating your famous um, turkey dinner and um, so uh, digestion is really disturbed by overeating and this is another concept that he actually demonstrated very well because if uh, um, Alexis was eating large amount of food, or if he was eating constantly, so therefore he was eating a venison steak, and then two hours later he was eating something else, and two hours later he was eating something else. This did not allow the stomach to ever empty, and therefore there was always some kind of trace of food that was sitting into the stomach. The same happened to us, uh, this is an annotation for everybody, is that when you eat too late, it takes approximately four hours to five hours to digest food. Beaumont wrote it down beautifully in his diagram. He actually can put all the time in, in there. And I think this knowledge has been kind of like ignored. Um, but that's what happened to you. As soon as you hit the bed and you have stomach content in there, that stomach will remain there. You wake up in the morning, the stomach, will, the food will be there into your stomach. And therefore, that's when you're going to feel sick and you're not going to feel good. Maybe you have a little headache. But that's because I think you, you, your stomach was unable to digest the food that you gave it to them because you gave it too much or too late. Um, liquid stay in the stomach longer than solid. So uh, this is a, 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 in reference to, for example, many people that love shakes. And you have to be very careful when you eat shakes. You have high energy calorie. Then now you put them in a liquid form. And therefore, that will actually delay your gastric end. In some people may work, but in many people will actually cause in bloating distension. You're going to feel that you actually, oh, I'm, I'm full. I'm stuffed in there. And you thought you eat something good because you put kale, you put whatever there, and you mix it. Um, um, but actually, it's not really how, the, how we're built. It's not how actually we're made. We're made with teeth. We, we require sometimes to actually do it. And so, um, but, but some people are able to tolerate it. So that's what makes the difference, I think, uh, in every, every of us. Um, the, the digestion is improved by moderate exercise. And you may have experienced that, uh, um, that if, if you just, uh, uh, move a little bit after you're eating. This is not running a marathon or doing the oval a couple of times. It's just like a little bit of movement, not just sitting after you eat the meal, uh, sitting at your, at your table and just walk around a little bit. It actually will help you with digestion. And then a certain amount of heat help in digestion. This is everybody know, but I put the, something warm, you take the, the warm tea or you put something warm on your abdomen to kind of like a speed up the digestion when you, you feel that you have, you have indigestion. Hmm. So, um, so in 1833, what we we'll learn is that the stomach ache is really the effect of overeating and over drinking. Um, he told us that many of the diseases of the GI tract are self-inflicted because we may be eating too much, too fast, too late, or something that we should not eat or consume. Well, this is a very hard concept to deal with because uh, who doesn't like to eat? I, mean, I come from an eating country and uh, um, we all talk uh, at breakfast what we're going to eat for lunch, at lunch what we eat for dinner, and, and so um, here is Beaumont, they're going to tell me that I'm doing something bad. But an important thing that I want to uh, leave with you is that the systemic illnesses affect the function of the stomach. So don't try to feed people that are ill 
over, make them overeat because that's a natural response to illnesses of the body that actually we start cutting down on the amount of acid that we produce when we have fever and then we start cutting down on the amount of uh, movement of the stomach. So the stomachs tend to be paralyzed and it doesn't produce much acid. So putting a lot of food down at that point, it will not really help. Yes, in fact, most of the time it would happen that you lose weight when you get sick for that reason because the digestive, the digestive tract is not ready to help you with digestion. So uh, this is always still a lot of controversy about Beaumont helping understanding an, an ideal diet for human. Uh, and this I found it very fascinating because, uh, so what is good for us? Meat, vegetable, fat, uh, what we are supposed to eat? I don't think that really he want to address any of this concept in there, but the important things is that to actually always refer into your diet to, to things who we are. Uh, you cannot believe that now all of a sudden they can prepare a food in a factory and, and that is the super food for you. And, and the other thing is that to really listen to your body because the body will tell you what is good for you or not. So if you really listen to yourself, you actually know, well, I ate too much last night. Okay, so then you know, I drink too much last night. I don't feel good this morning. So you know, I think that that's uh, um, what, what the trigger can it be for you. So uh, William Beaumont, with all this study, think about the explosion of information that actually occurred at that time, um, from nutrition to physiology to secretion to, uh, to the weather influence, and in particular the nerve system. After this, uh, the study of Pavlov on the dogs, where he was able to kind of like a, uh, ring a bell, and the dog was immediately start producing acid because it was he could make the association that food was coming. And then I think probably you can see in your household when uh, you try to feed your dogs or your cat. It is explain irritable bowel syndrome. This is a syndrome that uh, is very complex and many people uh, misunderstand what it is, but it's actually is how we interact with food. Uh, all of us has a different way of digesting food and uh, uh, Beaumont really put the, um, gave us the, the basic information on how to understand this. And uh, many people actually have developed more advanced uh, information about the relationship between food and the role of our intestinal gut. And that's what is called now irritable bowel syndrome. And the other one, it gives us the basis for our need to monitor food intake to preserve the health of our digestive tract. So uh, Beaumont, uh, with this publication, he became an incredible uh, famous person. Everybody wanted him to come to work uh, Yale wanted to come over there, um, New Jersey, New York, uh, Washington, and, and uh, however, he never really wanted to, he never really joined any of this uh, um, larger institution. Uh, this is a guy that has always been alone, has m moved to the North Country, uh, living in the United States Army, so he was not really handling the fame very well. Um, and, and the other thing that actually happened in 1838, um, is that um, Lovell, his friends in the United States Army and a big supporter of his work and, and, and research, uh, actually retired and, and died. And, and therefore, all of a sudden, the new person that took over decided that there's no money they're going for medical research. This is army is the army. So uh, cut the funds to that and Beaumont realized that there was not much uh, history for him in the future to um, continue to be in the army. So therefore, resigned in 1840. At that time, he was stationed in St. Louis, and therefore, he remained there and opened a, a practice there, and he stayed there until he died uh, on April 25th, 1853. So apparently, he, he died of a head trauma. He, uh, it's unclear <coughs> the detail, but it seems that he went to a home to see a patient, and then when he came out, slept. Some people say on the ice, but I don't know if St. Louis, there is so much ice in there. Um, anyway, he fell down and he actually he hit his head and he had a, a contusion and a trauma to the head and basically he, uh, he was dead. He is buried in the Bellefontaine Cemetery in St. Louis next to his wife. Uh, another information I want to give you just for curiosity since we're kind of like part of the history here is that uh, he had four children. Sarah, as I mentioned to you, she was uh, born in the same year that uh, um, he encountered Alexis Saint Martin. And then William, um, he was his second uh, child. He actually died at the age of two. And I believe, if I'm corrected, that he actually here buried in the cemetery here in Plattsburgh. 
Um, then his uh, other, he had another daughter, Lucretia, and the fourth child was a, a man, and the name Israel Green as the name of the father of uh, Deborah Green. Um, so, but everybody's always kind of curious about, well, so what happened to Alexis? I mean, what happened to him? So we know actually a lot of things because uh, as Beaumont was, uh, uh, became famous, Alexis was more famous than Beaumont. Everybody wanted to have Alexis. And uh, everybody tried to contact him. Um, everybody offered money, particularly in England and Scotland and Germany. Um, and he was a, 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 a poor uh, man, not much educated. Therefore, the idea for him to go to Europe definitely did not really appeal him. And you can see he even had hard time to come to Plattsburgh and to the United States. So therefore, he never returned uh, to um, the United States. He worked as a wood chopper. He had a small farm outside Montreal um, in uh, Saint Thomas de Joliet. And uh, um, he had 22 children, so he was pretty uh, active. Uh, and uh, he died at the age of 87 in 1881. Apparently, he was quite poor. Um, uh, they were able to calculate it that he received quite a lot of money uh, out of the United States Army and Beaumont itself in there, but he actually he was very poor. Apparently, he was uh, a heavy alcohol user. Uh, it was interesting because the day that he died, he was so terrified. Um, Alexis had expressed his will that he was so terrified that anybody would go dig him out of his grave or know where he's buried. So they let him for five days uh, under the sun decompose the body completely. In fact, as his funeral, uh, they could not put the body inside the church because it was too advanced and too decomposed. So they left him outside, and then they buried in an, in, a, in a grave that was no, uh, nobody knew it. And uh, actually, they say, normally we use a six feet under, correct, to put yeah. there. So he, he did two more feet down, eight, <laughs> and covered with another body so nobody could find him, and there was no way they could find him. So in 1962, a, a great uh, granddaughter um, she actually finally said, well, at this point, he's gone and there is no way that you can find it. So she actually notified that he was in the cemetery of the church in the town there. And they were finally able to put a, a, um, a honor to Alexis that actually, uh, you know, offered himself to science. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you think about it, it, this was an incredible story because this man, uh, William Beaumont, he was a farmer. He was really self-educated. He, he did not have the scientific background, although limited at, at that time, that you could have in big city where you can actually can discuss your experiment and science. He basically had him and Alexis and his wife in, in a room there and discuss it and, and perform his experiment. So he was able to carry on research that had been held valid for almost 200 years. So um, he basically put in his preface of his book this sentence here that he said, I had no particular hypothesis to support and I have, therefore, honestly recorded the results of each experiment exactly as it occurred. This is a very tough concept, actually, to do in, in science, because not many um, science actually think in this way. So it, I'm just going to express this concept. So basically, he just uh, did not have a hypothesis to prove it. And therefore, sometimes that's how we twist the data to prove the hypothesis that you say, I believe that this is blue, so now I'm going to buy everything blue. And this is the mistake that many times we hear news on, on the, uh, why science is not really correct. So he did not have anything so that. He had a model. He had an opportunity and decided that I'm going to take this opportunity, record it, what I see, and then once I have the data, I'm going to try to analyze it to see what the data says to me. And that's basically what it is. So this is actually true science. Um, this is a, and that's what I think of this man, it's so important. I think we should be so proud that it, it, it was here in this town. Um, the other thing that when he, when he was asked about his experiment, uh, he was very focused on these things, uh, and he talked about truth, which is kind of like it's a, we talk about fake news and many things in there for, for a long time, and this makes us reflect, I think, uh, some of this. And he say truth, like beauty, when unadorned, is adorned the most. And in prosecuting this experiment and inquiries, I believe I have been guided by its light. So I'd say a really profound concept. I think that uh, every time I really think about it to see what it means and how do I, I interpret it. But it, it's really kind of give you the spirit of this man that was really 
focus and really a, a attention to detail and, uh, um, and so therefore we give him um, the importance to him. So um, before I finish I want to just uh, give a special thank to many of the um, historic enthusiasts and many of the historians that I think are present in this area that uh, before me um, have done an incredible job to maintain and preserve the um, the knowledge of, of this information about Beaumont. So James Dawson, Eugene Links, and Bruce Butterfield, they actually, I think I saw some of you had a proceeding of the, um, I saw that somebody was in the audience. You had that? Well, it was somebody else's. OK. Book. Yes, you actually, you have the, uh, the, the things in there. So that's the proceeding of the uh, 200 years of birth of William Beaumont that was held uh, yeah. here. Uh, the bicentennial uh, with a, a conference at the SUNY Plattsburgh and it was uh, dedication to the building that I show you at the, at the first picture and this was done in conjunction with the University of Vermont. Other scientists and I think uh, Calvin here um, film uh, some other three person before me there was uh, John Southwick and Keith Hercalo and uh, James Dawson on a uh, in our uh, video I think about discussing the importance of Beaumont and Richard Frost who is an active uh, write about the history of this area. So um, I'm inspired by Beaumont. Uh, you can see my logo here. I was excited to actually to come up with a logo that we can put the stomach so, and the hole in there. Uh, if nobody had realized that. Um, but it, it was a lot of fun uh, to put that things together. And, uh, um, and I'm inspired every day because every time that I see a complaining, it made me think back at this man that by himself was able to come up with his, all this conclusion. And basically, I'm still carrying them on today. So thank you very much. I appreciate your, your time. And uh, if you do have any questions, I'm here to discuss with you. We, we have some questions on I'm going to stop broadcasting. And so in this way, you'll be able to see me. Uh, let me see. It should be here. Perfect. So the first question is from Allison. She says, I was taught that it is the enzyme pepsin that facilitates the digestion of meat. And pepsin is produced by the glands of the stomach. So yeah, yeah. So that's the correct. So that, however, the digestion is really initiated by the acid. Pepsin can only attack the amino acid once they are all together. Um, once the once the piece. So um, you have a piece of meat and it contains kind of like a coagulated, if it's cooked or not, uh, uh, protein. Pepsin will not be able to digest the completely the piece in there because it will not al allow to enter um, um, the uh, piece of meat. Acid will actually decompose and destroy the things, open up uh, the protein, and then pepsin will work. The true digestion is actually happen with the, the um, enzyme of the pancreas, um, and there will be more enzymes that are specific to. Uh, break specific um, amino acid bonds that pepsin will not do it. So pepsin will be an incomplete uh, digestion. Okay. But it's a second step. This is acid is first. This is a continuation of her comments. Yep. And other foods are digested more easily because of specific enzymes for carbohydrates, fats, etc. When were enzymes first discovered and did both Dr. Beaumont contribute to that as well? So uh, Dr. Beaumont did quite a lot of work uh, also on bile and production of the, uh, of the pancreas. The unfortunate thing is that his study were not able to advance them much in the area because uh, the biochemistry was not available. He collaborated with uh, a, uh, several physicians in, uh, uh, I remember there was a, in, uh, in New York City, uh, a few other cities I can remember, uh, and also in Scotland, uh, where he sent the vials of bile, vials of uh, gastric juice. Unfortunately, many of them were destroyed um, while they traveled there, so he didn't get enough information to be published in the book. However, he did not have enough knowledge of the lipid and, uh, and, and how that is metabolized, because we didn't have enough information about chemistry. So the only things that he was able to um, identify was hydrochloric acid. So Allison concludes with, thank you very much for dispelling the myth that Dr. Beaumont was cruel, sadistic in his experiments, etc. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, this is all the same. I mean, this is a, this is local business. They're trying to make money out of Beaumont. I mean, uh, um, so first of all, the 12 inches of, of, of lesion. I think I see a surgeon here in the room. Um, what would what would you think your opinion would have been? I mean, how? Uh, I mean, now you have uh, the opening of the stomach that is gushing out acid. Um, you have the rib cage. So you have a wound that actually go from the chest and the abdomen both at the same time. Now we're talking about 18, early 1800. So this is there is no sutures or all the tool that we have right now. We basically have this infection, and uh, um, there was no antibiotic. Uh, the guy was febrile for 10 days. Uh, he was shaking. Uh, he was septic. I mean, for sure. I mean, uh, uh, for all these things in there. Uh, and so Beaumont removed a piece of rib cage. He actually described in very detail. I think the pieces that he removed, a piece of lung was completely macerated in there. I'm sure he must have had a collapsed lung at some point because he could see the lung uh, tissue coming out of the things in there. So now, thinking about back, I I'm not sure that. I mean, um, that, that he could actually have the expertise. Or the, if there was any expertise to kind of like put the put the, these things together and closure, so um, I think we have to be realistic at the time where we are. Uh, definitely wouldn't need the transplant of, of skin to actually to put it in there. Questions? Yes. Any question from the audience? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. How do you think prevent the hydrochloric acid from coming out when the guy is in bed? So this happened, uh, this actually we see um, at a prop, so I, I, in my practice, uh, we frequently see you hear that people actually put the PEG tube inside. Have you ever heard about them? So it's a feeding tube, people that are unable to swallow or they, are, uh, they have a malignancy of the esophagus, they will not be able to swallow or they lose the esophagus for some other reason, they actually will be, will be feeding through a tube that is placed directly into the stomach. So that caused exactly what Beaumont um, saw in, in this patient, except that now we make an incision that is, you know, maybe a third of an inch that we put him in there. We struggle with the acid that coming out of the stomach and basically pour and keep the hole keep getting bigger and bigger because the acid will chew the entire muscle constantly. So that's why we use the famous uh, anti-acid medication to cut down on the amount of acid so we can protect the stomach for actually um, continue the erosion. Slowly, um, what happened in, in, in Beaumont is the opening slowly was closing, was closing down and the body itself adapted and the on overhanging of stomach tissue, they actually created almost a valvular uh, pattern in there. And so when he was eating, if he was sitting on the left side, he was putting uh, pressure on the things in there. So the stomach is actually here. Yeah. So it's in the mid chest. It's a little bit under the rib cage on this side, like this. So that's where it is. So actually, it's much higher. We always think this is your stomach. Uh, no, this is your stomach. It's actually here. And so it's, it, it's higher up there. And so by positioning, he was able to actually close it. But for the first year, he described it very well that he had a cloth that he was refreshing every day, putting compression there because otherwise the food and the water was actually escaping. Remember, at that time, he was not receiving IV uh, liquid and, and things in there. The guy was getting easily dehydrated, so, and he needed fluid, and therefore he was, he was ingesting it by mouth. But at night? So um, I, I don't have this, I, I cannot, I'm only guessing, so I cannot really say exactly what I think what he was doing. Um, you're not supposed to go to bed with the food in your stomach. <laughs> we have two more comments on the Yes, board. yes. Um, one is from Jerry. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. And the here. other comment is from Larry Todd, and he asks, where was Fort Zernak? So um, I actually have a map at home of all these things in there, and I should have re reviewed it. So Fort Zernak was, it's uh, along the Champlain River and along the Saranac River. So it's the conference where uh, I think there is an hotel, there was a famous hotel there that is uh, um, uh, in front of this train station. It, it's a, you, okay. if you know where this is, uh, the Fouquet House. Yes, so it's in that location there where uh, in, close to the, uh, to this, to the um, train station. So along the river and, and the uh, lake. Thank you. 
you were going to tell us a small story about Trevor. Yeah, and it's just really big. Uh, is it Trevor here? No. He, he, he wasn't actually the person here, the working here. I was actually the first person that I met in, uh, in Plattsburgh as I came here from uh, New York City to explore this area even before I decided to come to this area. Um, actually, it happened for 9 11. Um, I was supposed to travel to Scotland and uh, um, you know, every plane was grounded, we couldn't really go. Um, I had tickets for 9.13. So I actually came in this area, through Vermont, across the lake, Champlain, I did Chazy, Plattsburgh, Lake Placid. So I became very familiar with these things. So when I stopped here in Plattsburgh, I actually stopped to a store that was called Grand Onion, and I think uh, um, he, was, he was there, and he gave me a first sandwich, and uh, he welcomed me in town, and I told him that I was looking forward to see to get a job here. He was very excited, so uh, in the end, I'm back here. <laughs> so then me and Trevor again to meet again for a second time. So Trevor is the chef here. Yes, Trevor is a chef here at the MG, uh, MHA head. Any other question or any comment that you guys are interested in? And, uh, I actually do enjoy these things because it's interesting that in 1833, and if you think about the amount of knowledge, the amount of science that has been moving forward since then, um, so I'm just adding you these things about uh, the University of Australia in Melbourne, University of Melbourne in Australia, is actually had done an incredible amount of publication and uh, about FODMAP, F-O-D-M-A-P, which is basically, it's a, a, an analysis of the content of food and how we interact with that. Um, and that basically is the basis of irritable bowel syndrome. And, uh, and basically, we never really mentioned, you know, of course, the Australian, they don't want really to know about where Plattsburgh is, but the next time I'm gonna meet them, I'm gonna have to discuss with them, I think that they have to give us some credit that Beaumont already Put the, uh, was able to identify the certain vegetable that we cannot, that, that Alexis could not digest it, when actually going down and he was complaining of bloating and discomfort, or was causing diarrhea or constipation, and this is something that actually we all suffer, and basically is the, the different interaction that you have with food. So what is good for me is not that it's gonna be good for you. So please don't always believe or listen to what they say, this is what you need to follow, this is the diet that you need to follow, or um, this is the superfood, eat quinoa or Greek yogurt or whatever I can keep naming. These are all things that maybe are good for you, listen to your body, see how actually you interact and react. One comment I think is about is the food terroir concept. So I see here people from, uh, they are, know maple very well. Um, so um, we adapted to the food that they actually live with, where we live, where we grew up. Mm -hmm. So my gene, my bacteria definitely are different because I grew up in, in, in Italy eating different things than here. But slowly you will adapt it to the area where actually you, you do. Because every time you eat the vegetable, uh, there is mold on it, there is bacteria on it, and therefore you perpetuate it, certain things. And so when all of a sudden they ship food from another country, like quinoa, I'm saying an example, some, many people have intolerance to that because they never encountered the food before. Um, and, and so therefore it would, it would need time to adapt it if you want to continue to eat them a certain type, type of food. And also it makes the difference that why a certain food like your maple is different from other people because it will, it's based on the land where it grow and the same is things that we cannot make the same cheese they can do in France mm -hmm. even if we have the same milk or we cannot make wine even if you get the same grape because what the mold that is growing on the grape that will make it fermented, it's not the same. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to say we're, our, our next presentation will be um, June 17th. And um, it will be a, a photographic uh, story, the story, the historic uh, story of the dedication of the Stone Arch Bridge um, with Roger Black. And I think if you've, if you've heard Roger before, you know that he uh, offers you quite, quite an array of photos. Um, thousands of people attended this dedication, so I think you're in for, uh, for a nice evening. And that's um, June 17th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.